Okay, welcome back. Uh, right, so let's get into chapter 10. Before we do that, any questions, any other thoughts anyone would like to share? Uh, any questions? Shall we move ahead? I hope everyone are on the same page, uh, following along. Right. Uh, just feel free to stop me at any time if you have questions. Uh, feel free to ask those questions at any time. Right. So shall we move on to chapter 10? Yes? OK. All right, so let me just. Okay, so chapter 10, here the apostle points out to the Hebrews some of the lessons or some of the mistakes they made uh, in, uh, you know, in, in their previous past, right? He goes a little bit back and he warns the people of Israel from history saying, these are the things that you did and this is what the outcome of these situations were right and 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 so we can divide this chapter into four which is here uh, first one lessons from israel's history then he talks about the cup and the bread again he touches the matter of idols and sacrifices and food sacrifice to idols right so let's pick up from verse one right lessons from israel's history so verse one onwards moreover brethren i do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea when he's talking about fathers he's talking about uh, the hebrews who were coming out of egypt during the exodus all were baptized into moses in the cloud and in the sea all ate the same spiritual food all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play not let us not let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and they were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way for escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, the Apostle Paul is bringing out, he's going back into history, and he's looking at how the Hebrews came out of Egypt. They came out of Egypt with joy. They were singing songs of deliverance to God. God brought us out with his mighty hand. Right? Now, as they came out of Egypt, suddenly that joy was replaced with something else. Oh, I wish I was in Egypt itself. There was good food to eat. There was, there was wine to drink. There was nice shelter for us to stay. Why, Moses, why did you bring us out here? Now that you brought us out here, we are struggling. What happened? Those challenges, those difficult seasons, right? took them away from God, their, their mindset changed. And instead of looking at how they were in bondage for 400 odd years and God brought them out with his mighty hand, they looked at their current challenges and they went against God, right? 
as they journeyed, they saw a wonderful experience. Imagine the pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Can you picture this? Imagine a pillar of fire just going past everywhere in that desert. And just fire, just, just moving past. They've seen these things. They've seen the seas. The Red Sea has parted into two. And they're walking on dry land. They're seeing every day mana falling from heaven. All they have to do is go take it and eat it. And then there's water from this rock, sweet, tasty water, which they all they have to do is take and drink of it. They saw the miracles. They saw the hand of God. Now, all of them saw the miracles. Yet the same people, the Apostle Paul is pointing out and he's saying the same people disobeyed and lived, went back to idolatry, went back to sexual immorality. Right. So uh, you look at uh, the time at Horeb in Mount Sinai. It was one year, one month and five days. Right. So from Horeb, they had an 11-day journey to Kadesh. So it was right from the east of the river Jordan and they sent 12 spies and all of this what was 11 days they were wandering around that Mount Seir for 38 years okay a journey which was 11 days took 38 years and Deuteronomy I love how God says that right you have gone around this mountain for long enough now go the other way go northward but the the Hebrews the the Israelites thought they're making ground or oh, we're making ground to where we have to go no they were only going in circles now Paul is saying these have become examples why because you know they began to live in sin you know they they made a idol they began to worship that idol why because moses has gone up right why why did they do it right and here paul is pointing out some of the mistakes they made lust for evil things right they they were so used to the enjoyment in egypt they enjoyed meat they enjoyed the food now there's nothing wrong in enjoying food it's good but when those that enjoyment takes precedence over the will of God, over God's plan, what may be acceptable in one season may not be appropriate for another season. Right? Now, for so many years, they enjoyed the meat in Egypt. They're coming out. God brought them out of bondage. They can go and live their life in freedom, work in their own fields and earn and eat. But they're looking back at Egypt and saying, hey, we had meat over there. But the season God was taking them through was a season of manna, quail and manna. It was simple food, not very tasty as meat. But God knew that is enough for you in this season because when you get into your promised land, I will give you the best of the best. But he was testing them. Right? All they had to do was say, okay, anyways, another 11 days or 15 days we can manage this for 15 days it's okay god thank you for what you're giving but no there was lust for evil things they desired more right uh, i would say it became more of a gluttony gluttony is this it's a sin where we only think about eating right now it became a, a, an evil thing in the eyes of god god provided right? it's not like they were starving all they had to do is go and on the sixth day just just collect more for the seventh day so that they don't work on the Sabbath day simple right make what you have to make eat and move on they all were in good health after eating that none of them were sick among them their slippers were not torn off so yet with all this they were they had the lust for evil things Two, idolatry. Anything that replaces God in our life is an idol. Right? Uh, and so, in this case, Paul is pointing out that there was sexual immorality, one, 
there was really an idol that you all made and you all began to worship that idol and i was really upset and you saw what i did there and three you're talking about food the food is not good you know why have you brought us out here so anything that takes priority over god in our life becomes an idol so in moments or seasons of silence or inactivity when god is not saying or do and en doing anything we may tend to make up our own things for ourselves right so important to stay with the last instruction what did moses say moses said stay down pray and be down i will go up i will go to the mountain i will meet with the lord and i'll come back with further instructions what did they do oh nothing is happening god is not saying anything one day over two days over god is not saying anything they said okay since god is not saying anything we will do something we'll take all the gold everyone put your gold silver everything we'll burn it we'll make it into a nice uh, idol and then we can ask the idol to tell us what to do why because god was silent before that god was speaking meaning they were seeing the miracle so they didn't want anything so this is a very important lesson for us all the hebrews all that they had to do was say hey moses said be here and pray and seek God and uh, you know Moses said that we should not you know uh, go into idol worship God brought us out and there was a group of people among them who God saved but majority of them were you know uh, lost their lives that day stay with the last instruction avoid things that can uh, become an idol in our life three sexual immorality impurity as well now we looked at that whole chapter of sexual immorality paul began to you know uh, discipline the uh, the believers in the church in corinth saying it may be okay for others but as a child of god you are the temple of the holy spirit how can i defile my body uh, with a with a prostitute or with uh, with the things of uh, the devil right so paul is saying we must consecrate our sexual appetites it must be consecrated to god right first corinthians 9 27 says i must discipline my body and bring it under subjection and we looked at that verse right uh, lest when i have preached to others i myself should become disqualified and we see here the hebrews did exactly the opposite they knew that it is wrong in the eyes of God. They came to a point where own brothers and sisters were involved in sexual immorality or sexual impurity during that time. It was detestable in the eyes of God. So that's why God brought down that judgment. Four, tempting Christ, it says. Right now, they tempted the lord saying is is the lord among us or not right uh, now the amplified version says testing his patience question his purpose or exploit his goodness it's not like they are like how the enemy tempts us it's not that they were testing his patience right so it's so here paul is saying are we trying to test the patience of christ also by involving in all of these things sexual immorality idolatry lust for evil things are we tempting christ because they did that in the uh, our, our ancestors did that to god they tested god god is saying no you know sometimes you know when we read the old testament we look at it and we say hey god is so you know or he's always angry he's always bringing judgment but no it was it is just god's goodness all over god was so merciful how long would it take for god to just wipe out the nation of israel but he was true to his promise he what he promised abraham he said i will make you a nation you will be great you'll be like the stars in the sky because of that covenant he kept going for it 
Why did God send prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet? Just so that they turn from their ways. It was God's mercy there. But everywhere it's God's mercy. But mercy and judgment go together. Right? But mercy triumphs over judgment. There had to be, you know, sometimes they say the question that always comes to me is God is love. So how can a loving God do this? It does not make sense to ask a question like that. Why? Because if God is love, he has to hate something. Right? We love something. Right? For example, if we love the summer weather, most probably we don't like or we hate the winters. Or for example, we uh, we love to play indoor games. Maybe we don't like or we hate to go on outdoor games. It's simple. If you love something, you hate something else, right? God says, I despise what you do. So God is love. He loves us, but he despises the things that the people of Israel were doing. It was too much. He is a righteous God, right? He had to deal with it. Imagine, they were living in such sin and and they were not you know they were not thankful to god they were not there came a time when they said take us back to egypt we want to go back you know at least there we lived better this is not good they tried to kill moses right this is all testing his goodness we must be careful that we do not question god in a manner that challenges to prove himself Right? We don't have to, uh, you know, God is very secure in himself and he does not have to prove himself to anyone. Right? So, for example, you're praying for somebody and, um, you know, they, you're praying for somebody for maybe for healing. And you pray. Yes, we pray and if they receive healing, praise God. But what if they don't receive healing? The person can say, hey, your God is not true. Now, just because he does not receive healing does not mean that God is not the healer. He's secure in himself. He knows. He knows who he is. He knows how to deal with that situation. So here's the best part in ministry. We have a freedom while we minister. It's not our reputation at stake. It's God's reputation. Right? Now, we must believe his promise and not question his promise. The people of Israel, you know, you read the whole of Exodus, there's so many lessons for us to learn. They were murmuring, they were grumbling, complaining, what took 11 days. They, if, you know, if you picture it, I feel that 11 days would have gone by really quick. They would have gone to the promised land. God would have, what happened 38 years later, God would have just done it in, 12, 11, maybe 15 days, keep a few additional days for them to settle down. 15 days. Doesn't that sound so simple? Walk into the promised land. Get your land. Build, have your own places. Eat your own fruit. The labor of your own hands. Then you eat no meat, vegetarian, vegetables, whatever you want to eat, eat. But in that season, God was taking them through a season, 15 days, not a big deal. But they began to question God. Right? So this is very important, very important. Right? Especially when things are not going right in our life. We're saying, God, I, you're not saying anything. Things are going so bad. Why are you? What are you doing? Why are you not able to do this? Stick with God's promises. Those promises never changes. Right? Uh, they are they are true. Right? He may not be speaking. He may, sometimes he may just be quiet, just watching. It's not that he's looking to see. Let me see what they'll do. No, there's a reason. He's secure in himself. He doesn't have to prove himself. God knows what he's doing. So we must believe in that promise, right? not question him. So maybe some of us maybe going through that season of quietness. God, why aren't you speaking to me? Why aren't you telling me what should I do? Uh, it's, it's a difficult season, but stick to the promise. I don't question that promise, right? 
and uh, I I believe that if the Jew the Hebrews had just said okay it's okay 15 days everything would have just gone on smoothly but there was so much that happened uh, after that right fifth one complaining and murmuring so Paul is saying complaining of very small things uh, you know especially complaining during difficult times right we lose on God's purposes we say God why is this happening right things are getting uh, things will be unsettling at times right when you transition turning from a place where you're comfortable to a place uh, that is you know maybe God is taking you somewhere else uh, right uh, it's unsettling the the Hebrews who are coming out of Egypt they were there for years they were probably used to the lifestyle used to the food used to the culture everything they were used to it now all of a sudden they're in the desert uh, now now in the desert it's unsettling what about the food what about the house what about the uh, tent what about you know we had nice water the, the river Nile was there there was cool breeze here and the desert is only hot and dusty and, and you know murmuring complaining these five sins kept the people in the wilderness and away from the promised land and God said because of this you will not see but the following generation will see the promised land now the sad thing is when the following generation came they had no idea what has happened right that's why the book of Deuteronomy the word Deuto means second time so Moses had to write again okay this is what happened this is so if you read the whole of Deuteronomy it's all reminders of what God did uh, right? so these five sins lust for evil things idolatry sexual impurity tempting Christ meaning testing God's patience and goodness and fight complaining and murmuring right so these are things that kept them uh, away from the promised land for a long time verse 12 through 14 verse 12 let's look at verse 12 therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls right we should be careful that none of us fall into these sins we should guard our hearts walk humbly be watchful don't let pride come into our heart right uh, especially in times when things are going really well you know maybe in our workplace in the ministry things are going well uh, you're getting recognized it's very easy for pride to come into our heart right? so we, we must be careful and right? we must avoid that right verse 30 no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man but God is faithful he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able right the word temptation Greek is perisomos uh, which refers to testing trial experiment or proving right adversity afflictions troubles now there's a way of escape which means you and I can exit out of something right God has an exit for us a way of escape and we must run through that exit if we want to overcome temptation do not linger about saying I know where the door is but then let's see what happens we have to resist temptation and you know not yield to it uh, if you've seen the way temptation works it's 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 it goes through a certain process one the thought comes two we are enticed three we give in right but when faced with temptation run through the exit or resist to the end don't give in now here's the thing none of us can say we are not going to be tempted that would be foolishness right all of us whether we are pastors whether we are prophets whether we are uh, in ministry for one year or for 20 years 30 years in ministry maybe we know the whole of the Bible uh, Old, Old Testament New Testament we are Bible teaching whatever we are we will face temptation 
because the devil is not going to sit back and you know just say okay this person is like this no was jesus tempted yes apostle paul definitely yes but they ran when you say run doesn't mean they literally run in in, in the spiritually exited out of that situation look at jesus he led with a beautiful example right he says all three temptations he says it is written it is written it is written that's why in the book of revelations it says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony so god has given us an exit for example if we begin you know sometimes we may wake up and we say oh what a terrible day i'm having you know everything's so wrong everything's happening bad or oh, why is it happening now you know it's the enemy trying to just bring that feeling of you know negativity or hatred or irritatedness now we need to exit out of that it'll come but we need to exit out we say god this is the day the lord has made things may not look as good as it is or the way i wanted it but i will rejoice and be glad in this day thank you for the gift of life over you have exited out because you've already thanked god for something that is not going on right in your life the devil is not going to, he's not going to he can't do anything about it right so run from temptation or don't yield to it till the end right run from idolatry run from sexual immorality run from the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of it run from it right? and when you run from it god has given us that escape route you can always go to god now he's not going to let us be tempted more than we can take right meaning he knows he knows how to help us overcome he the holy spirit inside us will give us the authority will give us the boldness the strength to overcome it he knows so we may have temptation after temptation after temptation but the holy spirit inside us is willing to help us fight that temptation so it's a fight that we must fight we must run right then he goes on verse 15 onwards I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, it is, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partakers of the altar? Now, Paul recognizes that he's speaking to the wise, meaning he's speaking to those who are in the, the church in Corinth is in Greece. It's an intellectual capital. And he's inviting them to think now. If you partake in the Lord's table, you're sitting in Corinth, and I am sitting here in Ephesus. If you are partaking of the bread and I'm partaking of the bread, we are partaking of the same body. Physically, we are in different places. If you are partaking of the bl blood and I'm partaking of the blood, we are one body. Again, physically, we are elsewhere. We are in different places. Right? What does it mean? The word refers to koinonia, which means fellowship. We are partaking together. We may be in different cities, different towns, different countries, but we are partaking of that same communion. Right? and we're partaking in that one body the body of christ right so the cup of blessing this cup that we drink is intended to administer blessings into our lives right which means when we have it, when we drink of it it it's a blessing to our body we we are allowing the power of god's resurrection to come and work in our body and when we partake of the blood of Christ, we receive the benefits of the blood of Jesus. What is it? There's remission of sins, there's cleansing of sins, there's forgiveness, there's power in the blood of Jesus, there's healing in the blood of Jesus. So when we're partaking, we're opening our lives to the power of the cross. 
So all of us are partaking in that one body spiritually. So here Paul is pointing out to the fact that in the Old Testament, the people of Israel was expressed through the eating of the sacrifices made at the altar. Right. So he's telling the the uh, the Hebrews now, when you do a sacrifice and when you eat of that sacrifice, it is it's also meant you're becoming part of that sacrifice. You're in fellowship with that sacrifice. So whatever happened in that altar, the worship of God and and God's blessing on that is it becomes part of our life as well. God releases it to us as people. Right. So the important truth here is sharing in the benefits of the cross, the, the communion, many become one. So when we look at uh, food, he's talking about the cup uh, of blessing, which is the communion. And then he goes into how, uh, you know, eating of idols, uh, idols and sacrifices, eating of the food sacrificed to idols. Why is it wrong? Because he's bringing it into context here. He's saying, when we do this, we are partaking in the blessings of God. And then verse 19 onwards, he talks about the idols and the sacrifices. So he's saying here, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered is anything. Rather, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to the demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Right? Remember the previous verse, what was he saying? He's saying, see, I don't want you, know, you to eat if your brother or your sister in Christ is, uh, you know, is being offended or his questions his faith. So just for that sake, I will not have it. Right Now, he's bringing out another reason here. Is he contradicting that? No. He's just bringing out another reason why he would not eat. Right? If I am partaking in the sacrifice of my God and God is pouring out his blessings through that sacrifice uh, into my life, how can I partake in the sacrifice of demons? And because if I do that, I'm fellowshipping with the demons. So here he's saying now, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot partake in the Lord's table and the table of the demons. Right? So it's very interesting here, right? The sacrifices offered are actually offered to the spirits beyond behind the idols, to the spirits, the demonic spirits working behind them. The idol is nothing. He's saying there, right? The idol is nothing, but there are demonic spirits working behind the idol. And if I offer a sacrifice to this idol, the demonic spirits behind that, it's like I'm partaking with the demonic spirits. How can I partake with God and partake with the demonic spirits? There cannot be an association of the two together. Right? It's because there's a spirit working behind it. So a believer partaking in the Lord's table is fellowshipping with the Lord. And if the believer partakes of sacrifices made to idols, they are fellowshipping with demon spirits. We cannot mix true worship with idol worship. Now, why is he saying this? Remember, you see, the Apostle Paul is a brilliant writer, right? Before explaining something, he's trying to bring context. These are the sins that the Hebrews made when they came out of Egypt. These are the challenges they faced. That's why what was 11 days ended up 38 years. And now let me tell you what. This is what it is. When you are partaking in the Lord's table, when you are uh, you know, eating in the body and the blood of Christ, we are one body. doesn't matter where we are, what we are doing. We're one body. Same way, if you partake in the Lord's table, that's good. You're partaking in fellowshipping with God. But if you partake with the demons, with the idols, you're partaking with the demons working behind that idol. And you can't mix both of them together. Now, the Hebrews did that. They're partaking in the sacrifices to God. 
and then there's partaking in the sacrifices to made made to idols and the same thing is being repeated in the church in Corinth this provokes the Lord's jealous love and care for his people and we are not more powerful than him we are not to provoke the Lord you know some you know what is provoking uh, I, I'm sure you know. Uh, for example, right? There's a there's a boy who is. I'm just giving this example, right? There's a boy who's maybe ten years old, and for example, he knows how to ride the cycle very well, right? And there's a boy who's four years old. He's learning how to ride the cycle. Now there are two things that can happen. The, the boy who's ten years old can say, "Hey, why don't you you know pedal slowly, and then slowly put your legs up." Or why don't you? He'll give him some ideas. That is to help the person, help the other child. Then you have some people who will provoke. Go, go. Nothing will happen. You know, you'll uh, you'll fall. It's okay. You fall. Hey, be careful. You know, you know, just provoking the child, putting fear into that person, right? Or or making that person uncomfortable. We are not called to provoke God. When we know something is wrong. Stay away from it. Now here, Paul is saying, you know you're partaking in the Lord's table. Why do you want to partake in the other food that is sacrificed to idols? You, you're partaking of it. Now what is happening? One is the believer who's you know, uh, just new in the Lord. They have questions and you're, he may falter. Two, you're fellowshipping with idols behind the idol that's working the demon that's working behind the idol right so let's see what he he sums up there later on food offered to idols right verse 25 eat whatever is sold in the meat market asking no questions for conscience sake for the earth is the lord's and all its fullness if any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go Eat whatever is said before you, asking no questions for conscious sake. But if anyone says to you, this is offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for your for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whether you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. I like this verse in verse 31. Right? He sums it up. He says, therefore, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. So if I eat of the food sacrificed to idols, is it going to glorify God? Is, is God going to be pleased with it? Definitely not. So why would for my conscience sake, why would I do something when I know that God is not going to please, be pleased with it? So I will turn away from it. Right? Uh, and, and it says here, the earth is the Lord and all its fullness. Okay, I think we've got a question. Yes, Mangi, go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Um, on, the, on that question of... Uh, Food offered to, to to idols. Um, for example, uh, the Zulu culture is is here. When an elder dies, they kill uh, the slaughtered goat. It's like a sacrifice, and then the, the whole family has to eat. They have to make a meal afterwards, and it is normal. It's not to to, to normal people. It is normal, and for example. If a believer eats that food, for example, it's visiting your friend or family and they, they slaughter a cow, 
they, they do their offering and they just make a meal for everyone to eat afterwards is that sin because no one would be offended if uh, I'm a believer and I'm eating that food no one would be offended because I mm. ate it so is that is that bad and should we eat it okay thank you thank you Mangi so Mangi's question was for example he's at somebody's house they uh, offer a lamb or uh, you know and they uh, it's offered to an idol uh, and they cut it and as a believer for others it's not a problem so Mangi's question is as a believer sh there, there are no other believers around me so is it okay if I can eat it because I'm not going to offend anybody who's around me there are no believers and all of that so Mangi Paul the Apostle gives two reasons why we must not have it the first reason was so that I don't offend or bring another believer down just because of what I eat or drink now the second reason he defends the first one by saying that the second reason is if I am a believer I'm partaking in the Lord's table right uh, so I'm fellowshipping with him I'm one body with him so if I know this other food has been sacrificed or prayed over to an idol and I eat it we know the idol is nothing but there are demons working behind that idol and if I eat it just as how I partake at the Lord's table I'm fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus I'm, I uh, I recognize this death his burial his resurrection if I eat the food sacrificed to idol I will be fellowshipping with the demon that's working behind that idol so for my conscience sake I will not provoke the Lord by eating it right so Mangi my answer would be if I know okay so if I know that this is food sacrificed to idols I would not eat it right? uh, it may be a family gathering and all of that uh, I, I would say it's difficult right uh, I understand where you're coming from you know everyone are eating and uh, they will ask you why aren't you eating uh, you know you can just tell them that uh, you know sometimes you know in the day and age that we're living in now you can just say hey no I'm not feeling hungry I can uh, I'll probably eat you know or they may force you say you being family you must eat then you can tell them see um, you know I prefer not to eat uh, because I have my own reasons as a believer in Christ I believe that uh, what I eat should glorify God what you know uh, what goes into my body as a temple of the Holy Spirit uh, as uh, I know that God is in me so I what I eat and what I speak you know it, it should glorify God so if I do this I'm not glorifying God because I'm partaking in what has been happened before now the way we put it across should be we should be very careful Mangi because you know we can't say this is food sacrifice to idol it's a demon behind it we, we you know we can't speak that way right we, we be very sensitive we say um, so I prefer not to have it right uh, now especially when it's a family setting and you're the only believer it's difficult but again it stands as a testimony if you continue to say no uh, uh, I prefer to honor God in my body it stands as a testimony so Mangi uh, Apostle Paul gives two reasons one is so for the fellow believer and when there is no fellow believer around I don't want to partake in the Lord's table being fellowship to fellowship with God and also partake in food sacrifice to idols because I will be fellowshipping with the demons now does not mean that uh, you know immediately some curse will come upon me right that's why he says no, don't test God God is good God loves us God cares for us but just because he's love he cares for us he protects us he, he we call him so don't test him don't provoke him when we know it's not right just avoid it right we don't have to see let me eat let's see what God can you know let's see uh, if anything will happen to me I don't think anything will happen to me we don't have to do all that right uh, so to answer your question Manki I would somehow avoid it right? uh, they may have a lot of questions they may rebuke us or uh, but when you stand it could turn out to be a testimony uh, I hope that answers Manki Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Uh, if I, I may ask one more question. Yes, please. go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, 
Um, in the world, there are so many uh, festivals, like, uh, for example, in India, I think it's called uh, Diwali or something, the yes. Kala Festival. Yes, yes. Uh, Kala Festival has uh, it's something that has become popular even here. Um, every year, thousands of people, not Indian and non Indian, they flock the road. Christian uh, celebrate it. So, is this a good, it's good for believers to celebrate uh, such festivals? Uh, yeah, so Manki, the answer would be no, it's not good for us to celebrate that because we're celebrating uh, what the idol is doing, right? What the demon is doing behind the idol. So basically, we're, we are honoring an Id a, a demon, right? Uh, like we know that that's why Paul, he brings it very clearly. He says the idol is nothing, but there are demons working behind that idol. So if I celebrate uh, uh, a festival that is, uh, you know, honoring a demon. Then I'm honoring. Then I'm, you know, glorifying a demon. So as believers, we must not. Right? We must not. We must not celebrate it. Right. So we can just avoid it. It's not. Uh, again, we are not provoking. We we, we don't provoke God. We don't don't provoke the Lord Jesus. So we know it's wrong. Just avoid it. Now, the thing is, you know, sometimes. Uh, you know, people who are not yet strong in the Lord, they don't understand things. They go ahead and and it happens everywhere, Bangi, even in India and different nations. They, you know, they just uh, they just do it just because everyone are doing it, but they don't understand the repercussions that can happen. They don't understand that they're opening their doors, so they're opening their life for the demonic, uh, for demons and the work demonic work to. You know, work in their lives. It could be strongholds. It could be negative thoughts. It could be temptations. Anything, right? So it's like we're opening the door, and we don't want to do that, right? So we don't want to open the doors for the enemy to come and uh, bring things in our lives. So, yes, Mangi, as a believer, I would say don't don't involve in it. Just just let it go. Like people will be there, believers who are doing it. Maybe you can tell them what what you're doing is wrong because this is what the Bible says. But you don't have to. Uh, it'd be wise to not involve and celebrate that, right? So, okay. Uh, yes, Sri Kumar, go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. I have two questions. Um, yes. um, uh, one question as you. Now you have suggested like uh, you should not celebrate the festivals which uh, Gentiles are celebrating. Mm. Now, now my question is this: that we know that the Christmas and the Easter is not from the Bible, mm. and it is actually a demonic uh, culture which came out, and uh, now the Christians are celebrating. Mm. So the the it is not nothing connected with the with Jesus or nothing connected with um, God. Mm. And uh, then why we are celebrating because that is um, if uh, we are doing that we are actually glorifying the demons. So, so it's my question is that uh, is it to uh, so then we should not celebrate uh, the Christmas and the uh, and the Easter because it's directly connected to it. Thank you. Okay, that's a good, very good question, Shikuma. Now, uh, I'll just quickly answer and then we can probably uh, take up some more time next class and uh, just remember this question Shikumar. you can write it down uh, sure, yes, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure. so if i'm not able to answer both we can uh, yeah so you're right so the the christmas was just a, a a day now if you look at the gregorian calendar right it is definite that jesus was not born in december right uh, history says that he was born somewhere around march april somewhere around that time uh, probably now it is a day to recognize the birth of the Lord Jesus, right? Now, when we are celebrating, we are celebrating his birth, right? We are celebrating the birth of a Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not that we are celebrating, a, 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 you know, or we are not worshiping an idol or anything on that day, right? There's no idol worship. We are remembering. A person who was born, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? As a Messiah, he was born. God came into this world. We are remembering the person. There is no idol worship there. There are no demonic spirits on because when we are remembering the Lord Jesus, there's no demonic work happening there. 
right now ishtar which is easter yes it is a a, a day or you know the uh, i i forget what it is but ishtar i think is the uh, the idol of uh, i forget that what what her thing was uh, and then you know eventually it became easter now this is a good question sri kumar but i would say does that glorify god now yes it is over time changed from ishtar to uh, to a day easter where we think about the lord jesus christ's resurrection and this came these changes came over time but what i would say is as long as we are not glorifying a demon working behind it right now we, when we are remembering the birth and the resurrection of our lord jesus on easter there's no demonic work happening behind the roots may be demonic right they 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 you know the the uh, previously but we are not thinking of that we are thinking of uh, i hope i'm trying i'm i'm trying to get this into as short as possible but we can discuss more on this uh, and, and so we are remembering the lord jesus right uh, we are partaking in the lord's table so there's no demonic work as such happening there right so it nullifies what has happened in the past because we we are looking at the lord jesus and he is greater than any the idol is nothing again right so uh, shri kumar i think we we can discuss more on this sure. i i know that uh, sure, yeah yeah i know you may have a lot of questions <laughs> yes, uh, yes but you may have to go to your next class so yes uh, so we'll you. close thank okay okay thank you so much thank you everyone uh, and have a great week ahead i'll see you next week right god bless you all